Uh, me and Don Tuttle and a few others. Uh, so we're still active in the society. And today we're going to be talking about this with Patty Fleshner from the Trinidad Museum on the early, early explorers. I saw her at Pioneers. I saw her at genealogy. I took her Ollie class. If you guys ever get into Ollie classes, they're wonderful. And now this will be my fourth time to hear it, and I'm not getting enough. This is a lot of original research. So before I finish introducing her, I do want to mention that anyone is invited to these meetings, which we have the first Saturday of each month, except December, July, and August. Uh, and you don't have to be a member to come, but if you're interested in getting our magazines, and there's one freebie left up here, uh, we do have membership forms, applications. How many are already members? Most of you. And uh, if you want to join and get the magazine, um, there's applications here. And we're also here at the privilege of the uh, Humboldt County Library, who lets us use this building. So we're very appreciative. So we like to see uh, support for both the library and, of course, the Historical Society. Um, I, and next month, uh, I don't want to forget that, uh, the meeting here will be April 7th, I believe, the first Saturday, and Alex Service and uh, O'Hara, Susan, Susan O'Hara, are going to be sharing their newest book on the mills of Humboldt County. So this will be the later, later edition, so you don't want to miss that. And with that, I do want to share, see all of the things that she's going to share with you and it involves mainly the uh, bodega and the Heseda trip down here and if anyone knows their history they're the ones who claimed Trinidad for Spain way back and then they also connected up with Vancouver who was another one of the early explorers here and she has done a tremendous amount of research on this so with that Patty uh, I did say that you're the curator and president as well yeah. of the Trinidad Museum, and you guys need to get up there and see it if you haven't already. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Arlena. We'd be hard put at um, Trinidad Museum to have uh, many uh, objects or articles without our Arlene. She <laughs> is a constant resource of wonderful things. And, in fact, one of our treasured possessions up there is um, framed, I could have brought it, but it's fragile. It's a framed um, family crest of Juan Francisco de la Bodega y Cuadra. So um, the way I'll use this, maybe I don't need it, but I'll ah, give it, is that better? It yeah. is. Okay. Better, yeah. Um, so the um, we all, most of us who are interested in Humboldt County history know that in from June 9th to June 19th, 1775, uh, Juan Francisco de la Bodega y Cuadra on the Sonora and Bruno Heceta on the Santiago came to um, Trinidad Harbor and claimed on two days later on June 11th, 1775, claimed Trinidad for Spain, naming it La Santissima Trinidad, um, since it was Trinity Sunday. And uh, they stayed for 10 days, um, wrote journals, the, uh, both Bodega and Heseda wrote remarks in journals about their trip to Trinidad, and of course all their explorations. And um, Morel, the pilot for um, Bodega wrote his journal too, and uh, so did Juan Perez, who was the second in command of the Santiago. As well, of course, they have on, they always had on board the Catholic ships. Um, Father Campa was the one who, uh, with great solemnity, claimed Trinidad for Spain. So a lot of us know that this story, and it's outlined in this really wonderful book, The Four Ages of Turai, um, which starts with the, uh, the Yurok Indians, of course, who lived and still live in Trinidad. And then it goes on to the Spanish explorations and the fur traders and the gold rush and so on. And um, so 
some of my interest started at first with this book, and then a colleague of mine named Jim Webb, he's on our board, he loaned me a copy of Vancouver's journal of his travels in California. And um, Vancouver came to Trinidad in May of 1793, so 18 years after Bodega Naseda, Vancouver landed in Trinidad and just stayed for a few days. And then, reading further in Vancouver's journals, I read that these two men met. Um, Bodega's a little older. His dates, they both died young. Um, Bodega's dates are 1744. This could be plus or minus. There seemed to be some uh, question about the birth dates for both of these men. But it, 1774, and Bodega died in 1794. So just two years after the main period of time that I'm going to talk about today, 1792, when these two amazing men were together at Nitka. Uh, George Vancouver was born in 1758, and he died in 1798, having completed a four and a half year circumnavigation of the um, world. And um, the reason these two men were in Nitka together, they met in Nitka, was they were both experienced navigators diplomats, very intelligent men, and they were um, assigned by their uh, respective courts, Spain and uh, Madrid and London. Florida Blanco was the foreign minister in Spain, in Madrid, and Fitzherbert was the foreign minister in London. In um, the, go back a little bit, <laughs> In 1775, the um, headquarters for the Spanish Navy was San Blas here in Mexico. San Blas was founded, as it were, in 1769 to serve the first California mission in San Diego, 1769. So between 1769, only six years, um, there are, of course, today 21 missions, starting with um, San Diego and then on up to Monterey, and that became the, the Alta California headquarters for the Spanish. And then here's Trinidad, <laughs> um, 16, uh, 1769 to 1775 is only six years when the, the southern part of Alta California was explored. It wasn't really very, this is 1725, this world map. And uh, nothing, really, it's, this is terra incognita <laughs> up here. Very, very poor map of um, California. Nothing was known. So this is 1725. So the difference between 1725 and 1775, when um, Perez and uh, Haceda and Bodega and um, Morel came to Trinidad. It was huge. In the map from 1775, here we are at San Blas, Mexico. San Blas up here. We have. Um, yeah. <laughs> I lost Trinidad. Oh, there's Mendocino Bodega. Okay, here. Here's Trinidad. And you'll see up north here in 1775, very little was still known. It was more thoroughly known than before because after Bodega and Morel, and Perez and Heseda were in Trinidad, it was part of a major exploration in, thanks, mm -hmm. thanks, Arlene. King Carlos um, III of Spain, for whom Trinidad was claimed by Spain, 
was his uh, reign was 1758-1788. He was probably one of the more enlightened monarchs of Europe. He was a Bourbon king, not a Habsburg, as the the uh, previous kings had been in in Spain, and. Um, he was more educated, he's very interested in hunting, but he was interested in science, and he was interested in anthropology, he was interested in minerals, of course, because uh, there were a lot of, there were a lot of gold and silver in Mexico that he was very interested in. So, during the period of Carlos's reign, you could call it this, the absolute zenith of the uh, Spanish Empire. And it was during his reign that the Inquisition, which had been so um, such a damper on any kind of intellectual growth in Spain for, for hundreds of years, uh, King Carlos started to eliminate the Inquisition. And um, he's the one, it's because of King Carlos the Spain, of Spain and then a much enlightened viceroy in Mexico, and that's where uh, Bodega and the other Spanish sea captains got their orders from a man named Bucarelli in uh, New Spain was also enlightened and an intellectual. So Spain had been not much involved in the European trade, commerce. They started in, in this late, the, the late 1700s is when Spain was at its absolute height as an empire. So it was in it was Pope Alexander. The reason the Spanish were here, of course, on the, the whole Western Hemisphere, was because of a papal bull in 1493, right after Columbus, that the Pope basically gave free reign to Spain and Portugal to settle the, the Western Hemisphere. So by right of discovery, that's why the Spanish were here. And in these days of exploration in the late 1700s, um, they had every right to, they, they claimed the entire Pacific Northwest coast. That was all Spain's. Nobody went inland <laughs> very much. Um, that was going to be for the Americans later to do. But um, they, they uh, the reason that the Spanish kept moving on up the coast, and here's where, uh, of course, in Vancouver Island, where the um, Nootka is, where in 1792 Vancouver and Bodega met. Th they were there because um, in 1775 and later on, the Spanish court, heard through Catherine the Great in Russia, and from various French explorers that there were European settlements that might occur along the Pacific Northwest. And uh, that was not acceptable in the eyes of the Spanish court and Spanish king. And so uh, some of the fear was ephemeral, although the Russians certainly were busy up here. The uh, Bering, the Danish man Bering was 1741. So the, there were some Russian um, activity up here in Alaska, but really nothing much to worry about on the California, Oregon, Washington coast. Late in Fort Ross, that was later, that was in the early 1800s when the Russians came here, and it really was to serve, and when Fort Ross was established, what, 1809, I think, 1808, and only stayed about 30 years. Their fort there, Fort Ross, near Bodega Bay, <laughs> was to serve the uh, Alaskan settlements because the crops didn't grow very well. And of course, that didn't work out. It was just way too far to haul um, uh, food, grain, and so on. Anyway, the whole exploratory thing for um, the Pacific Northwest was exploration, discovery, and because the inspiration of Carlos and Lucarelli in New Spain to find out. They were curious about minerals. They were curious about soils. They wanted, you know, there were 21 missions by 1823. They wanted um, to spread Catholicism. 
and have more missions. It, uh, in the journals of uh, Bodega Naseda, it's mentioned that Trinidad's soil and the topography and plenty of water there, that potentially it would have made an excellent mission. <laughs> and uh, no one ever, the Spanish never came back to Trinidad. But, um, okay, need to move on to uh, Bodega in, in Vancouver. So, the fur trade started in earnest after Captain James Cook. You all know him, the Englishman James Cook, in the uh, late 1860s, 1870s, excuse me, 1760s, 1770s. He went round the world, and James Cook gets a lot of credit that George Vancouver doesn't, because of course he was first. George Vancouver was on board, he was a young seaman, um, teenager, on board um, James Cook's ship when James Cook was massacred in the what they call the Sandwich Islands, the Hawaiian Islands in 1778. So he, he was not high enough in rank to take over, but he was with Cook, so he, he was not afraid same boat that had come into Trinidad the next year. Um, in the process of boarding the boat, two or three spoons, silver spoons, Spanish silver spoons, disappeared. Now whether Perez gave them to the Indians or whether the Indians took them, it's indetermined. However, when um, uh, Cook, and, and later on um, some of the Spanish explorers and the English explorers and the French and the Portuguese explorers were starting to come into Nootka for fur trading. That was the big impetus for everybody but the Spanish. The Spanish were not interested in fur trading at all. They were interested in possession and saving souls, establishing um, establishing themselves as the rightful owners of the Pacific Northwest. They, at this time, were not remotely interested in fur trading, but it, it planted a seed where maybe they would be interested in it later, and they were, but not at this time. So um, when Captain Cook came into Nootka, uh, some of the um, Mohawk, I should, I'll spell it in a, in a minute. Some of the Indians were where he saw a necklace made out of silver spoons and he had been around the globe. He was, he was pretty sure these weren't jewelry from Nootka um, <laughs> in the Pacific Northwest. So they were Spanish, he examined them, they were Spanish silver. Later on, this became a very important element, even though um, Perez in 1774 did not plant a Spanish cross like he did in Trinidad and elsewhere along the Pacific Northwest. He claimed this area nonetheless, even though he didn't land uh, and plant a cross. So um, the Nitka remained unsettled by anybody, but in the 1780s, the fur trading really started to flourish. And there were, um, this, oh, that's all right. This is a picture of Nitka Sound, Friendly Cove, where I visited, I'll tell you about that later. Um, this is a, a picture. So in, 17, in the uh, 1780s and by 1790, 91, 92, this was a busy, busy port. And um, these happened to be Bodega ships and shows the Indian canoes there too. Uh, so in 1788, a man named an Englishman named John Mears. John Mears um, landed in Nootka Bay here in, uh, or Friendly Cove, they called it. Uh, Cook named it that. Mears landed there and he built a boat, the first European boat 
to be built in this in Friendly Cove, in this remote part of the world. And um, he he was not probably the most straightforward gentleman, but um, later the um, a man named Estevan Martinez, who was in charge of San Blas at the time, when in 1788 Bodega was actually in Spain. Uh, and most of the really capable naval officers in Spain were in, um, were in Spain. They weren't at San Blas. So, through a French explorer, <laughs> Uh, via the Catherine the Great's court, they got wind that the English were trying to settle Nootka Sound. And Mears built a little house over here, built a little house with, and he said in testimony later in Parliament, and this is important because he's, the, this English man is claiming now, he's claiming um, occupancy and settlement of the Pacific Northwest. This was not acceptable in the eyes of the Spanish court. Esteban Martinez went up to Nootka um, at the request of the Viceroy of New Spain, and he um, took possession of Nootka Sound. And he took, here's, the big, here's where the Nootka crisis came from. There was an English man named Col Colnett there, and there were several English ships. Um, one, it's hard to know who drew the sword first, but there was an altercation between Colnett and Martinez over um, possession of the sound. Mr. Mears had claimed over here where he had his little house and built his boat um, that he had purchased Friendly Cove from the Indian chief Maquina. M-A-Q-U-I-N-N-A, who figures largely in the Bodega story later. Um, he had purchased the uh, Friendly Cove in this area from McQuinna for, it was, there's two accounts. One says it's several sheets of copper. The, the Indians, all the Indians along Pacific Northwest loved metal, iron, the, the barrel, the metal around water barrels. Um, iron, copper, anything. They loved metal because, of course, they could make tools and weapons from them. Um, so Mears claimed that he had purchased this property for either two pistols or copper uh, sheets. Esteban Martinez disputed this, and he took possession of Colnet and three English ships. <laughs> and this was an international incident. Then in 17, this, this happened in 1789, 1789. This was a major, for those times, a major international incident. Colnet so was hauled down to New Spain, uh, San Blas, and taken prisoner. He was very well treated. He was never tortured or uh, anything. He was treated very, very well. And his ships, though, were seized by the Spanish. His ships were used to sail, you know, to the um, Philippines and to China for trading. So the Spanish borrowed coal nets and the English ships. So, um, Esteban Martinez was not a diplomat, unlike his later compatriot, Bodega. He, he was hot-headed, apparently. Um, but he did what he did, and um, because of this 1789 incident, um, that's when Bodega and Vancouver get into the picture. So in 1790, a, um, the Nootka Convention was signed by the two foreign ministers of Spain and uh, England in Madrid, and it was Vancouver, who had never met Bodega, and Bodega, who had never met Vancouver, and uh, they were sent to Nootka. Now, Bodega was a very proud, ambitious naval officer. He had had a hard time rising. One of the reasons he was in charge of the little schooner, Goleta Sonora, in the Trinidad exploration was because 
he had been trained as a naval officer in Cadiz, Spain, but he was born in Lima, Peru. So Spaniards, you had to, you know, to be a Spanish officer, Spanish aristocrat would take precedence. So they were equal in rank, but Hazeda was the guy who was in charge of the frigate, the Santiago. And um, the little schooner, uh, Sonora was only 38 feet long. They were, oh, they were on the boat. It was like 14 feet wide, 38 feet long. You couldn't, you know, people were a lot shorter then, but you couldn't stand up below decks. And here's this crew on this boat for 10 months in 1775. Anyway, he proved himself as a naval officer. He went on another expedition in 79 and had been in Spain trying to sort of rise in his ranks and hadn't succeeded, so he volunteered to come back to New Spain as the commandant of um, San Blas, this horrible malaria-ridden port, which at the end of the story, uh, at the end of the story, Bodega says, please move the port of San Blas to Acapulco for a better, uh, place of, for living and for building for every other reason. Move the port to uh, Acapulco, not to San Blas, because the, the, the men, when they, they were actually, nobody, no sailor, no Mexican or Spanish or Indian sailor on any of these voyages wanted to go to the Pacific Northwest. It was too cold, it was too windy, it was horrible. And uh, the same reason we lose some of our population now, and probably because we're not overpopulated up here in the Mole County. But it's worse as you go further north. So the, the Spanish and the Mexicans weren't overly fond of getting on these ships and going north. But they also, they hated San Blas um, for its disease-ridden atmosphere. Um, so Bodega didn't have grand enough ships didn't feel like the Spanish uh, prestige was uh, to his standards. So he built three ships instead of going to San Blas. He took um, materials and men down to Lima, Peru, and built these ships to head for Nootka. Um, and so this Nootka Convention, which said, um, Spain and England, in the Nootka Convention articles, agreed that there would be freedom of uh, freedom of passage in and out of Nootka. So they, if anybody could trade, anybody could trade, they would share charts, which was unheard of in early days. Another reason why the Spanish aren't still here, probably they were very, very secretive until this time when Bodega and Vancouver finally shared charts and maps of the area. So there was, um, in the Nitkin Conventions, free trade was agreed to, free passage. Um, and, and because the Spanish weren't, uh, you know, 100% settled in that area, the courts of Spain and England really didn't know that much about this area. They, um, the courts in Spain, very vaguely phrased the conventions where they might hand over um, Nutka to the English. But here's what happened. The Vancouver and Bodega being very far away from the internet, <laughs> phones, any, uh, you know, mail, any kind of communication. One of the re reasons for their tremendous success up there was they were both intelligent, reasonable, honest, capable gentlemen and officers, and they could be trusted by all their crew and the Indian chief, Maquina, up there, their fellow um, officers, other men and other crews in the ships that were coming out and into Nitka fur trading, they were trusted. And so they were, their communication 
once um, Bodega had the advantage, he was a little older, remember he was born in 1744, Vancouver in 1758. So he had the advantage of age and wisdom and experience on Vancouver. And plus, in 1792, to uh, follow the orders of the Nootka Convention in 1792, Bodega got up to Vancouver um, Island, then not an island, it was thought to be attached to the mainland. Um, he got up there in May. And Vancouver did not arrive until late August. So while Bodega had those five months or four months ahead of the Vancouver arrival, he had a chance to interview the people who were living in the, by then there was a Spanish settlement, and he, he had developed a wonderful relationship with McQuinna. And um, through courtesy, respect, there's, there, everything about this story is of um, the kind of statesmanlike behavior that we all you know, long for in leaders all around the world. And in these two men, we had that in this little space of time. And I think that's one of the reasons this story is so fascinating to me. Plus, they got along well with McQuinn and the Indian chief, who saw McQuinn was a very shrewd fellow. He became chief uh, while Captain Hook was there, 17, um, 70, uh, mid to late 17, before, right before Cook was massacred in Hawaii or Sandwich Islands. So McQuinn supposedly died around 1795, but he was Indian chief for a long time, very astute, um, and he saw the advantage of supplying all these English, French, Portuguese, American fur traders with sea otter furs. So he became a wealthy Indian chief there, and, um, and was a very strong, very strong leader. Um, okay, so Bodega was in Nootka for a few months before Vancouver arrived. He was able to interview McQuinna and the other sea captains and got the story um, from all their reminiscences about the Estevan Martinez and the Perez Spoons and, he, and what Mears had done there. In fact, Rio de los Tortolas, which is the little river, was marked on the Morel Bodega map because it was considered a possible Northwest Passage. Every, every river was considered a potential Northwest Passage, including the Columbia, which Heseda saw uh, after the Trinidad voyage and they headed up um, to the north. Heseda spotted the Columbia River, but he didn't penetrate. Um, hence, Robert Gray, the American, or the Boston man, as he was called, fascinating character. He's given credit for discovering the Columbia River because he actually penetrated it. And this was in 1792. And as a side, in case I run out of time, this because this is important to know, just to show the character of Bodega and how he got along with everybody, uh, Robert Gray was there giving testimony about the Spanish settlement and possession in, the, in Friendly Cove and um, became so close to Bodega that uh, Robert Gray named his son after Juan Francisco Bodega uh, de la Bodega y Quadra. And on the way home from uh, Nutka um, in, seven, in uh, Bodega left there September 21st, 1798. <laughs> um, Bodega had admired the craftsmanship of the American or the Boston men vessels because they were much more maneuverable and fast than the Spanish ones. One of the impediments to exploration with the Spanish ships were so heavy, so bulky, they weren't really good at getting in and out of these little, these little inlets, you know. There's just so many ones here. Anyway, so uh, Bodega purchased from Robert Gray a vessel that Robert Gray had constructed nearby 
to, and he called it the, uh, it was called the La Ventura, and later Bodega changed the name, um, to give. He purchased this vessel from Gray to give to the Spanish uh, Viceroy in Mexico. So the, the relationships up there were so close, and um, Bodega was loved by everybody. So, okay, back to the Juan de Fuca Strait and the Columbia River. So Columbia River was considered um, a potential Northwest Passage. Gray discovered it, and Vancouver just kicked himself again and again and again with all his incredible navigational skills. Vancouver actually missed the Columbia River, and, and so giving another chance to someone besides a Spanish or an Englishman for discovering the Columbia River. Columbia River is named after Robert Gray Cecil, the Columbia. So, in 1792, knowing on the way to Nitka, Vancouver knows he's going to Nitka to meet Vancouver to try to settle this dispute, but he's here at the Juan de Fuca Straits. He penetrates the Juan de Fuca Straits, meets, and Peter Puget, Puget Sound and Whitby, these are the guys that map Trinidad Bay. Um, on the way back down in uh, May 1793, it's Whitby. We have our Trinidad map. It's Whit so Whitby Island, Puget Sound, Peter Puget, and Whitby are on on the Vancouver vessel. Incredible people, <laughs> and um, so there, on the way to Nitka, which is going around this way, nobody knew that there was a passageway here. Nobody knew that, but at this time. Um, Two Spanish uh, colleagues of Bodega, named Galeano and Valdez, they were on the Sutel and the Mexicana, were their vessels. They came into Juan de Fuca Strait and met Vancouver about the same time. So Vancouver was very surprised to see these Mexicans, uh, or the Spanish people there. And uh, uh, Valdez and Galeano were very gracious to Vancouver and his men, vice versa. They were um, very courteous. They agreed to share their charts, and they even went about to here. This is the Johnston passageway here. Johnston was one of the men on Vancouver's boat, and that's why this inland passage is named after Johnston. And this is Georgia Strait that Vancouver named it after um, King George the third, of course. So, in 1792, again, this is just emphasizing the, the uh, tremendous exp exploratory uh, navigational skills of these people. Everything came to a head. They discovered that Vancouver Island wasn't part of the mainland, and the Spanish and the English shared charts together. That's one of the the overriding and most fascinating aspects of this whole voyage that that this international cooperation <coughs> occurred in a very special time in our history. Um, getting toward the top of uh, it, uh, the, the Mexicana and the uh, Sutil couldn't make it quite as easily through the Johnston Straits here as Vancouver ships. Although the, uh, the discovery, Vancouver ship went aground right about in here <laughs> on the way to Nutka to meet Bodega. Um, and back to Nia Bay, remember I said that the Spanish were thinking about giving up Nutka if they could establish themselves at Nia Bay, or Nunez. Um, Nunez Goya, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Um, the Sutil and the captains Galeano and Valdez got to, be to Bodega before the during the negotiations. The negotiations over Friendly Cove at Nitka were 13 letters, and Bodega and Vancouver did not speak each other's language, but they were lucky. They had on board um, the uh, Bodega's ship was this amazing scientist, Massigno, who spoke French. 
and Spanish and English. So he helped translate um, these 13 letters that went back and forth during the negotiations. Meantime, a man named Thomas Hobson was on Vancouver's ship. He spoke Spanish and French and English. And so he helped translate. So these 13 letters back and forth, everything took a lot of time um, to translate. But in the meantime, this is the really neat part. Bodega in Vancouver got along famously. They, um, they entertained each other. They, when Vancouver arrived, 13 uh, <laughs> cannon were shot off to welcome Vancouver. Vancouver, in turn, shot off 13 cannon to honor <laughs> uh, Bodega as he came into Nootka in uh, August 28, 1792. And they both toasted their sovereigns with 21 gun sal salutes. Um, this man, um, Archibald Menzies, These two amazing men, Archibald Menzies and uh, Massino, these were the two botanist surgeons on board the two ships. So these two even got along. They went looking for plants and animals together. This voyage was um, instrumental in naming just hundreds of plants, animals that had never been identified before anywhere in the world by, by Europeans. Um, so Archibald Menzies' diary, you know, sometimes the Bodega and the Vancouver are both excellent writers. And of course, I don't speak Spanish, so I'm at a real disadvantage. I've, I've read all the, the uh, Bodega journals translated into English. But he's a wonderful writer, and so is Vancouver. And they are colorful journals. but. They're all, they also can be very cut and dried. You know, our latitude, longitude, and the wind was <laughs> this, and the soundings that are taking soundings everywhere they go to find the depths of the ports and whatnot. And um, so they're, they're very businesslike, and they don't have a lot of color. Mazzinia and Archibald Menzies, on the other hand, theirs are very colorful <laughs> uh, accounts. And um, Archibald Menzies is a Scotsman, he says, uh, there was so much puffing, he calls it, going on. Every time a new ship, a French ship, remember, while they were there, there were 30 foreign ships coming and going, yeah, that doesn't happen now. There's right, one ship. This is a, When I went to Nootka last August, <laughs> this is an old uh, World War II minesweeper. This is the ship I went on. There are no ships <laughs> in Nootka. Sound now in Friendly Cove, but there were 30 trading ships there. And um, so they, uh, whenever anybody arrived, they got 13 guns. And then when they toasted a sovereign of any country, they 21 gun salutes. And so Menzies made the crack. We're, we're wasting so much ammunition that we're going to have a hard time defending ourselves for the rest of this voyage. And, and a lot of his accounts are, are very colorful. Um, so they, they arrive. Uh, they're there for roughly uh, Vancouver and Bodega are together for less than a month from August 28th to September 21st or 22nd. And um, they saw each other every day. Bodega allowed uh, Vancouver to set up his observatory so he could take his, his astronomical measurements. Um, he provided them. He had dinner on his silver plate. Um, not silver plate. It was probably solid silver. He had a service where he served almost every night Vancouver entertained on his ship, not on land. But there was a commandant's house right here. Sorry, if I do this again, I'm going to get PowerPoint going on. Here's the commandant's house where Bodega served um, dinner to the officers of Vancouver ships, three of them. There was the, not just the Discovery, but there was the Chatham and the Daedalus, the supply ship. 
and any other ships that came, everybody was invited to dinner at Bodega's house every night. And that included McQuinna and his, his several wives. <laughs> and um, his daughter came of age uh, while he was there. There was a big ceremony for her to which all the Spanish and the English were invited. Um, that was, we have some unique pictures which if we have time, I'll, I'll show you, or you can stay after, I'll show you. The ceremony for the, so the, McQuinna is entertaining the sea captains. Bodega and Vancouver are entertaining each other, all on this like 500 pieces of uh, silver plate. And the, the day or two after Vancouver arrives, they go up to Tahiti's. This is a more modern map. So here's Friendly Cove. Here's Tahis. So they take little boats. Vancouver and Bodega, they take the ship's steward. <laughs> and they take some of the officers. And they go up to be entertained by McQuinna at his home. And um, the entertainments consist of a lot of masks. They were. Um, Bodega enjoyed it very much, but there was a lot of dancing with, with spears and very fierce makeup and faces where uh, some of us could be intimidated by this because they would imitate their uh, European soldiers or they would try to show their strength for how, what wonderful um, fighters, soldiers they were. So, um, Bodega brought all the food and all the silver to entertain McQuinna and all of his family and friends, neighboring tribes, all on Bodega's silver. Just imagine a picnic, you know, out at Patrick's Point Park <laughs> with 500 pieces of silver plate and all these delicacies, which, you know, they had, because of the settlement earlier in the 1780s, early 1790s, before Bodega got there, they had planted crops, and they had sheep and cattle, which didn't do so well up there. Pigs did pretty well, and uh, crops, barley, barley did well, wheat and corn did not do well. Um, but anyway, they had, uh, animals up there. They supplied Vancouver's men with food when they didn't eat together. Same with McQuinna. And then the, the, so the day or two after they arrived, McQuinna had this amazing entertainment. And not to be outdone then, Vancouver's men did little, you know, reels and <laughs> dancing. <laughs> some, some of his sailors put on an entertainment for McQuinna's people. Um, so this I'll just, here, I'll take the time to get this picture. Is it? Oh, this is a picture of the San, Santiago. Never mind my little taps. Don Puddle is horrified at my, these are all my books, not library books. <laughs> <laughs> my tabs. Oh, dear. Well, this, this is a good picture. This is Galeano and Valdez, the Spanish officers. The ones on the Sutil and the Mexicana that accompanied Vancouver some of the time. Oh, here we go. McQuinn's home. Okay, this gives you a little idea. Those of you wow. who can see it. So this is McQuinn's home. Here's McQuinn himself doing a dance. And uh, for the these are the Spanish officers. I um, I think this is Vancouver and this is Bodega because Menzies said they were seated at this celebration. And by the way, in addition to the over in Mazzino with Bodega, they had several fabulous artists with them and um, that commemorated this meeting. And uh, um, there was a lot of speculation about you know these totems. That are in the house, and um, there, there's a lot of remarks about their religion. They have creation myths, somewhat the same way as Yurok tribes do, and some of the other Indians that we're familiar with in America. But um, the totems weren't called totems. I've misnamed that. There's story poles. Story poles is what we should call them, not totems. So the one in McKinleyville, that's a story pole. Uh, 
anyway, they, uh, they all entertained each other and, and had a, a fabulous relationship. Um, let's see, I'm nearing the end. I wanted to, okay, I wanted to show you the results, even though you can't see this, but you can see it afterwards, because this is so remarkable, given the fact that in 1725, in the Pacific Northwest, we're just terra incognita. We know nothing about the Pacific Northwest. So at the end of the voyage, because of the sharing between the other sea, it wasn't just Bodega, but it was the other sea captains, mainly Bodega, we have what even today, I'm told I'm not a geographer, but I am told that, or I've read, that the map of Bodega is very, very close to what we would use today for the correct measurements. So Bodega shared this with Vancouver because Bodega had spent quite as much time between Trinidad and Mia Bay, Vancouver had. So this is Vancouver's chart of the entire Pacific Northwest Coast. So the happy ending for these two men is they, the actual Nitka controversy was not settled because Bodega was a better negotiator. He had the advantage of speaking longer with McQuinna and some of the other sea captains there rather than fight over Friendly Cove, Bodega had been told by the commanders of the Sutil and the Mexicana that Nia Bay wasn't what they had hoped. Fidalgo, remember, was the man in charge of Nia Bay, and they'd set up camp there and ovens and everything else to settle. And, and then Bodega's Mexican colleagues say, no, it's horrible. It's too windy. It's, you can't get a good harbor. You, um, the, the natives were not friendly at all. Some of, in fact, <laughs> one of them brought as a, well, this was before a, a massacre. One of them brought the hand of somebody as a present to Fidalgo. Now, whether that was a gift or whether it was, watch out, <laughs> this could happen to that you. Was it was not known for sure, but uh, this Nia Bay was not some place that the Spanish wanted to settle, and that was going to be their most northern post. So, Bodega, knowing this, knowing the orders from his Spanish court, to back off a little with the English, in his 13 letters between Vancouver and him, he said, no, we're not going to do this. You, you can have free trade here, and you can come and go as you please, and we'll give you this teeny weeny Bodega gave the concession that he could, that here's where Mears built his little ship and had his little house. This is all a friendly cove that um, Vancouver could take this little um, quarter acre piece in Friendly Cove, but not the whole deal. So they ended their negotiations in September 1792 with, because they'd become so close, such good friends, uh, we'll refer it back to our courts. So they kept, they kept Spain and England out of war for a couple of years. Um, and then in 1793, well, you remember 1789 is the French Revolution. February 1793 is when Louis XVI of France was beheaded. This changed everything. This changed everything for everyone. Spain um, and, uh, and England really gave up their Pacific Northwest exploration at that time stage and every, all their attention turned to Europe. And um, then, of course, you know, France and England were at war with Spain, but this was later. For, between, for 1792 was this golden era of good feeling between the two countries. And, um, you know, then later the Napoleonic Wars, um, where 
Napoleon seemed to to use some of the same diplomacy in some areas that Bodega and Vancouver did, and that was that it still works to some extent, I guess, today, where you get, if you're going to conquer some place, get to know your, your people and treat them the way you'd like to be treated. So it worked then for Bodega in some areas. For Napoleon, it worked for him, uh, not in Russia. <laughs> but. Um, that was, the, that was the end of the negotiation. Then, because it wasn't settled, there was still hope. So the Bodega sailed back down to Monterey, and Vancouver was headed that way too. Um, they were going to meet in Monterey to see if they received any word from their court. They preferred the, the Nitka Sound controversy, the Nitka Sound um, convention articles back to their courts in, in Spain and London because there wasn't a decision on whether to turn over this land to England. And so they both got down to Monterey, um, still no word. So, but they, but they were there for uh, over a month. Uh, Vancouver arrived in late. Uh, November 1792, they left uh, in January, sailing away together with this matter still unresolved, but um, they remained friends. And so the hospitality that they enjoyed between the two of them in, um, in uh, Nootka remained in Monterey, too, that they continued that where the they had celebrations together. Vancouver put on fireworks. Um, Botany Bay, the penal colony in Australia, had just been established in the late 1780s. And Bodega insisted that Vancouver, was, Vancouver wasn't going to England. He was still going back to Australia and then to the Sandwich Islands. And then later on in May, he went into Trinidad at, uh, on Bodega's advice. And uh, so they entertained each other royally in, in Monterey as well. The, uh, they did entertainments. A little, a little aside from this is there was a, two Hawaiian girls, one 14, one a few years older, that's mentioned in Archibald Menzies' uh, journals. Not Vancouver or Bodega, but one of the ships that came into Nootka Sound had two Hawaiian girls on board. And the captain of that ship, it was called the Jenny, said that these two Hawaiian girls needed to get back to the Sandwich Islands. Who would take them? So Vancouver said, I will hop on board. So these two girls, and it's not determined why they were on board. Any ship is not explained by anybody. Menzies suggested that some people said they were slaves. Um, others disputed that. But in any case, these two Hawaiian girls that had to go back home were um, in Monterey, and so Bodega was putting on the, you know, the fandangos with the castanets and all this, the Spanish dances. Well, Vancouver said, "Girls, how about a dance?" So the the two Spanish, the two Hawaiian girls did their dance for one of the entertainments, and the Sp apparently this that was not a hit. The Spanish ladies took offense to that because I guess they thought that was. Maybe they weren't wearing enough clothes or something, but uh, the, the girls did get back to the Sandwich Islands. It's, in any of all this stuff, nothing is explained about why they were on board. <laughs> but one was 14, one was a few um, years older. But they were treated well, that, that we do know. Um, so let's see, I'll end with this. Um, this one. Yeah, this is um, this is in Bodega's journal, uh, which is a trans. The, the book I have here is in Spanish, but this is Bodega's journal. This is a wonderful book I got through the uh, University of Oklahoma Press. Um, so. This is the last they saw of each other. 
in Monterey on uh, January 17th, um, 1793. So this was right before King Louis XVI was beheaded. So the tumult in Europe was, was heating up enormously. So um, Bodega writes, as the Aranzuzus, that's one of the ships, speed was so poor, that's the ship he was on, and as Vancouver was being prejudiced by waiting for her, I did not wish to place him at a disadvantage because he had the courtesy to vary his course.